Imagine, if you will, the perfect mid-century American suburb. A town like something out of a faded postcard. Rows of cute little cottages with white picket fences, neat green lawns, and tire swings hanging from peach trees. There's a main street with a movie theater, an automotive shop, a burger joint, and a drugstore. It's populated by happy nuclear families who have successfully achieved the mid-century American ideal of a stable, successful life. Every morning, newspapers are delivered to front porches, still warm from their time in the rocket ship. The townspeople are eager for news. From back on Earth, everyone is anxious on updates for how life has been at home since the start of the atomic war. For now, Life is good here in this idyllic little slice of American suburbia, even if it is on Mars. And that's for the best, because soon it will be the last trace of human existence before the species dies out. Are you enjoying the video so far? I hope so. We release one of these pretty much every week, which means that after this one, you'll have to wait at least another seven days for your next Tail Foundry fix. Although, technically, you don't really have to. We've actually made a ton of stuff that isn't up here on YouTube, like this video about the morphology of angels and why artists always give them wings, or this one about artificial life as a magic system. We even made a whole original series called Worldsmiths about our favorite authors and the unique landscapes of their minds. And hey, if you just don't want to wait for next week's YouTube video, the truth is, it's actually already out. That's right. You can watch it right now, ad-free, along with everything else I just mentioned, over on our streaming platform, Nebula. Visit go.nebula.tv slash tailfoundry to sign up for just $2.50 a month. It's honestly one of the cheapest and best ways to support the show. Thanks so much to everyone who checks it out. Back on Earth, an atomic war is raging. The little blue planet's days appear to be numbered. I mentioned earlier that all human life is on a fast track to extinction. The war is certainly a factor, but it isn't the only thing threatening humanity. Actually, Humans seem to have a pretty good chance of making it out of this. America has started sending rockets full of normal, everyday families up to Mars in order to establish a new home there. The plan is simple. Transport civilians up to Mars, one rocket ship at a time. They'll have all the materials they'll need to build more towns and construct an infrastructure to support the next chapter of humanity's story. One of these families is the Bitterings. Harry, Cora, and their three children. When they finally arrive after their long trip, you'd think they'd be relieved to be out of the rocket ship. Excited, even. Not just to be away from the war, but to be here, in this new place, on the soil of their new home. And, for the most part, they are. Except for Harry. The moment Harry sets foot on the surface of Mars, he can feel that something is wrong. He can't place what exactly it is, just a foreboding feeling that this planet may not be the safe haven humanity was hoping for. He almost immediately wants to go back to Earth, but knows it's out of the question. They've come too far, 60 million miles too far, to go back now. Harry is the only person in the entire cohort of Earthmen who seems to feel uneasy about living on Mars. Every time he brings up his concerns, the other settlers brush him off. Not even his own family takes his worries seriously. For now, he tries to keep his fear in check and help the others construct their town. And construct it they do. It's beautiful. Just like the towns they left back home. If you didn't know that you were on Mars, you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. Right? Harry's not so sure. Even after all their hard work, Something's definitely off about this place. 
He just can't quite put his finger on it yet. After a while, these gnawing concerns grow into a consuming paranoia, and he finds himself keeping a close watch of everything they brought with them. Harry's obsessed with making sure that everything, the seeds, the livestock, building materials, even their own bodies, stays the same. Even if he doesn't quite understand what it means yet, he has a strange feeling that if he lets it, Mars will somehow change these last few precious staples of humanity. It doesn't, though. Not at first. For a long time, things seem to be going very well. Nothing changes. They are humans, living the new human existence on Mars. His paranoia seems unjustified. Until they receive the news that an atomic bomb has been dropped on New York. There will be no more rockets to or from Earth. This is the beginning of the end for humanity as we know it, but Harry's the only one who realizes it. Something shifts, then, now that they're trapped on Mars. There's no way off and nowhere to go. The Earth people are stranded and defenseless, and now Harry thinks almost absurdly Mars would eat them. When the changes come, they begin with the plants. The seeds the humans brought from Earth, germinating here in the strange Martian soil, are producing unexpected results. At first, Harry is the only one who notices, and admittedly there isn't much to notice. He plucks a blossom off the peach tree that they had brought with them as a sapling from Massachusetts. He inspects it, and something seems to be very off about it. He shows his wife, but she doesn't notice anything amiss, and Harry can't pinpoint any specifics. Something's wrong with the smell, or the color, or there are too many petals. He can't place what it is, just that it's wrong. Harry starts on a tiny rampage through the garden, looking for something, anything, to confirm his suspicions. He uproots half-grown radishes and carrots and onions. They're all off in some small, indeterminable way that makes his skin crawl. Onions, but not onions, he mutters. Carrots, but not carrots. His family watches him in concerned alarm as he inspects the rose bushes. And there, in among the flowers, he finally finds what he's looking for. Something real, finite, not just a feeling or a suspicion, but an actual observable wrongness in their new world. The roses are turning green. Not long after, they notice that their cow is growing a third horn. Harry had been right the whole time, and his family can clearly see that Mars is corrupting the safe, familiar things they brought with them from Earth. The once green grass of their lawn is turning purple, and the Martian wind is warping their perfect white cottage out of shape. Worse than all of this, though, it doesn't seem to matter that he was right. Somehow, he seems to be the only one disturbed by all of this. He stops eating the discolored vegetables, insisting that they're poisoned and that the food is slowly causing their bodies to change. His wife chalks it up to his imagination. But it's not. And before long, he starts to notice subtle but observable changes in the other settlers. One of them seems taller than they had before, another skinnier. One man's gray eyes suddenly have flecks of gold in them. His wife's skin is getting darker. Her eyes have taken on a gold coloration. He sees a subtle new sheen on his children's skin, metallic in their beds at night. The influence of this new place can no longer be denied, but maddeningly, Harry still seems to be the only one who cares. He knows it's only a matter of time until the same changes start to warp him. He refuses any food grown on Mars, only eating the meals that they had brought with them from Earth in their deep freeze, hoping that this will keep the planet's claws out of him for a little bit longer. He builds a workstation at a metal shop in town and sets to work constructing a rocket ship so his family can escape back to Earth, atomic war or no. The settlers stand around, teasing him, watching him work, looming taller, thinner, and darker in the open garage door as the days go by. 
onions, but not onions. Humans, but not humans. The changes aren't just physical either. One night, Harry wakes up with an unfamiliar word on his lips. Lord. The local archaeologist tells him that this is the Martian word for Earth. There is no logical way for him to have acquired this vocabulary. Martian is a dead language. The original inhabitants of this planet were long gone by the time the Earth people arrived. Harry picks up the pace, working non-stop on the rocket ship. The food from the deep freeze is gone, so he's stopped eating. The Martian summer is heating up. The day is getting longer, his body getting weaker, and taller, and darker. His family and friends start begging him to give it up, to come home and rest and eat. The more exhausted Harry gets, the more annoyed he becomes with their constant hounding, and the less motivation he has to finish the rocket. Finally, Cora invites Harry to join her and the children on a trip out to the old Martian canals to cool off. Harry is hesitant at first, but the exhaustion finally wins out, and he agrees to go. The trip does wonders for Harry. If only for a little while, he's able to escape his consuming paranoia and just relax. As he lay in the sun with his family, he can see how much they've changed, barely recognizable from the people he had gotten out of the rocket ship with. Tall, thin, their skin baked dark from the sun, hair and eyes bright yellow. But this time, when he looks at them and he sees these changes, he's not afraid. It's almost as if, here under the sun, in this peaceful place, the anxiety has sloughed away like so much sweat. Dan, one of Harry and Cora's sons, asks if he can change his name to Linnell. It's a surprise. It's a Martian name that he feels is a better fit for him than his old Earth name. To Harry's surprise, he and Cora agree with very little hesitation. They end their trip to the canals by exploring the nearby Martian villas. Amongst the blue marble architecture and cool waterways, the Bitterings are finally able to get some respite from the heat. When they at last return to town, Harry finds that his mood has shifted somewhat. He doesn't have the same feverish drive to work on the rocket. Nobody is helping him. The working conditions are abysmal, and he doesn't even know if there's anywhere left on Earth to flee to. Ever since the trip up to the canals, Harry's found it hard to care about going home. He's eaten the Martian food, visited the Martian settlements, gotten used to his no longer human companions and their no longer human names. Going home is becoming less and less of a priority for him. The old fever is gone. A short time later, the Bitterings are invited to vacation with the other townspeople. Not just out to the canals this time, but to the old abandoned Martian villas themselves. There's still a tiny part of Harry that wants to see the construction of the rocket through, but his friends say that he can just pick it up when they all return in the autumn. And that's enough for Harry. His family packs up their car with far less of their belongings than they had originally brought with them to Mars. Harry's books, Laura's dresses, all the little human elements that had once been so important to them are no longer deemed necessary. It's just a few months up at the villas. Surely they don't need all this clutter. They say goodbye to their human house and their human town and drive away without sparing a single backward glance at the place they had worked so hard to make their home. Months pass at the villas. The Bitterings have become unrecognizable. They barely resemble humans at all anymore. They can't even seem to remember what it was like to be humans. To their minds, they have always been the tall, dark-skinned, golden-eyed people of Mars, and always will be. Harry and Cora, or whatever it is they go by now, gaze down at the abandoned Earth settlement from their hilltop villa. It's autumn, the time when they had vowed to return but there's nothing worth returning to. The rows of clean, cute cottages have been warped out of shape by the Martian wind, no longer resembling the houses they were built to mimic. The chairs in the movie theater sit empty, 
the projector gathering dust. Tire swings sway on brittle ropes. The trees they're anchored to have changed color and are heavy with unknown fruit. The garage door to the metal shop stands open, and inside, a half-built rocket frame is starting to rust. Such odd, such ridiculous houses the Earth people built, Harry says to Cora as they look down at their old settlement. They didn't know any better. She responds, Such ugly people. I'm glad they've gone. Obviously, this was not a true story. It's from a piece of short fiction called Dark They Were and Golden-Eyed, written by Ray Bradbury in 1949. He was one of the kings of science fiction, and his work tends to have this foreboding, sort of icky feeling attached to it, without necessarily being horror. I like this story a lot in particular because of how harrowing it is to watch this character that you know is correct slowly lose his motivation to fight for his humanity. All you can really do is watch him succumb to the change. It's a bit scary and more than a little melancholic, but I also don't necessarily think this is a tragedy. At the very end of the story, five years later, another rocket from Earth arrives, intending to rescue the settlers. They, of course, find the human city empty, and the only living beings from miles around are the Martians up in the villas. The last lines of the story focus on one of the newcomers having reservations similar to Harry's. It seems like this is going to be a cycle. Humans arrive, humans begin to change, humans become something else altogether. Perhaps this continues until Earth itself is empty, all of its inhabitants having gone to Mars and been transformed. If that's the case, I suppose it spells the end for humanity, perhaps the quietest possible extinction event. But if that were to happen, would it really be that sad? I think humans are inclined to feel like Harry, to see changes to their identity as this invasive, horrible thing. But maybe becoming something else would be a relief? A surrender of all the outdated fears and anxieties that plague a species so fixated on retaining your you-ness. Harry fought so hard to protect his humanity, but in the end, he doesn't find peace until he gives it up. The Martians at the end of the story are undeniably happier than those humans who first arrived on the planet when the story began. The story doesn't frame this conclusion as a tragedy. It's haunting, yes. But it's almost a happy ending. Does that mean it would be a good thing? That humanity should embrace whatever defining changes inevitably touch the species in the future? I don't have an answer to that. I'd rather leave it up to you to decide. But I do think the story poses an interesting ultimatum. You can either be consumed by change, trusting yourself to adapt to the new ways in which you and the world around you are changing, even if it threatens to turn you into something else entirely. Or you can be consumed by your defiance of change, holding on to what you are now at all costs, even if it means living in constant fear, hardship, and isolation. In a sense, you lose yourself either way. It's really just a choice of what you'd rather be instead. And I'm afraid that's all for this week. Our next video will be coming out in a week from now, so I'll see you then. Unless, of course, you don't want to wait. We've actually made a ton of stuff that isn't up here on YouTube. Like this video about the morphology of angels and why artists always give them wings. Or this one about artificial life as a magic system. We even made a whole original series called Worldsmiths about our favorite authors and the unique landscapes of their minds. And, of course, if you just don't want to wait, next week's YouTube video is actually already out and ready to be watched. That's right! You can watch it right now, ad-free, along with everything else I just mentioned, over on our streaming platform, Nebula. YouTube is kind of a crazy place to make content. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to have this platform, 
But you have to be so, so careful about your topic choices, your packaging, what you include in your videos. You just start to feel like you're walking on eggshells. Nebula doesn't have any of those concerns. It's an entirely different environment, devoid of all the weird YouTube cynicism. The entire platform was built by creators for creators. Every time you watch a video there, a creator you love is getting paid, and far more than they would ever get paid on YouTube. And on top of that, Nebula even helps its creators to fund incredible original content. You know, like our series, Worldsmiths. And we're not the only ones who have been busy over there. So many other amazing creators have started creating and sharing their own unique stuff on Nebula. Like our friend Frankie from the channel A Bit Frank, or Tim from the channel Hello Future Me. Heck, there's even a high production, independently run sci-fi audio drama over there called The Sojourn, which is just so good. I've been listening to it while working lately and loving every second of it. Nebula is just a really unique, fun, fresh environment. It kind of makes watching videos on the internet fun again. Speaking of which, here's the really fun part. Nebula is already cheaper than almost any other streaming platform on the internet. Like $2.50 per month? That cheap. But right now, for a limited time only, we're offering you the chance to get Nebula for life. All you have to do to get started is click the link in the description or go to go.nebula.tv slash tailfoundry and sign up for one year. That's it. Frankly, I'm not quite sure how they can afford to do all this, but I'm definitely not complaining. Seriously, take advantage of this offer while it's still going. I don't think any better one exists in the world of streaming. Anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next week. Bye.